Okay, um, good evening, everyone, and welcome to this uh, fellow Geckos meeting, um, where uh, Gillian Gaskin, one of our fellows from uh, Ngozi Albert, is going to be talking to us about dyspepsia. So, um, Gecko is hosted by the Gastro Foundation in association with Project Echo from the University of New Mexico. It runs every second Monday at 6 p.m. And please note that if you have any questions, you can post them in the chat. And yeah, so for now, I'm going to hand over to Jillian to talk to us about dyspepsia. Yeah, you can share your screen, Jillian. Good afternoon. Um, can everybody see my slides? Yes. Good. Clear. Um, good afternoon, colleagues. Um, thank you for the introduction and thank you, Dr. Siabi, for your um, guidance with this uh, talk today. Um, our topic for discussion is an approach to dyspepsia, including um, how do we go about assessing and investigating a patient who's presenting for the first time as an uninvestigated um, dyspepsia patient, and then just some um, best practice management in terms of what's currently um, available for treatment of functional dyspepsia. So at some point um, in their lives, one in five adults report dyspepsia symptoms. It's a common presentation to clinical practice, and although Dyspepsia in general is not associated with a higher risk of um, mortality. The condition can be chronic and in many patients follow a fluctuating course. Dyspepsia can have substantial impact on a patient's quality of life. Um, it's associated with more time with work, lower productivity and greater medical and prescription drug costs each year. There is financial implications for society as a whole. And there's a huge burden on health services um, with the reported cost of providing health care to patients with dyspepsia in the U.S. sitting at around $18 billion per year. So it makes sense then that practitioners are provided with cost-effective management strategies to tackle this problem of dyspepsia. Um, these are available to us in the form of guidelines, the latest one being from the British Society, British Gastroenterology Society um, in 2022. And I hope that the talk today provides some practical insights into the condition. So what is dyspepsia? Dyspepsia is an umbrella term. It's used to describe digestive symptoms that are localized to the epigastrium. Over the last 35 years, the definitions of dyspepsia have evolved from a very broad one, which included any symptom related to the stomach or the duodenum, including things like heartburn, nausea, and vomiting, to one now that actually highlights only the cardinal symptoms of epigastric pain, epigastric burning, postprandial fullness, and early satiety. Early satiety is defined as a feeling of fullness during ingestion of a meal, which results in the patient terminating their meal. Recent definitions also recognize belching, nausea, upper abdominal bloating, and heartburn as associated symptoms. So the symptom of heartburn alone should not be regarded as dyspepsia, and vomiting if present is very atypical and should actually prompt consideration of another disorder. Dyspepsia can be caused by organic disease or be classified as functional if organic disease is not found. Organic causes can be from luminal pathology, pancreatic or biliary disease, as well as systemic conditions, aspirin, other non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, alcohol, steroids, iron supplements, potassium chloride, to name just a few, are medications that can also be associated with dyspepsia. In terms of the frequency of some common causes, this systematic review by Ford and colleagues found erosive esophagitis to be the most common organic cause at around 20%, peptic ulcer disease at 6%, Barrett's esophagus at 1%, and gastroesophageal cancers at less than 1%. Most of the time, the endoscopy is normal, in which case a diagnosis of functional dyspepsia would be entertained. 
Approximately 40% of people with dyspepsia symptoms will consult a primary care physician having never sought prior consultation, and this is termed uninvestigated dyspepsia. The physician has to then make a decision on how to cost-effectively investigate and manage the patient. By the time patients are referred to a gastroenterologist, most of the leg work is already done. But it is important for us to be aware of what the current recommendations are in the management of uninvestigated dyspepsia. So let's get into it. One should always be in mind that the or indigestion, as it were, is actually something very difficult to articulate. And with the addition of language and cultural factors, one needs to be very careful and do their best to try and understand and to quantify exactly what the patient is trying to say. 80% of the time, after going through the whole process, a diagnosis of functional dyspepsia will be made by the physician. And you need to actually positively convey this diagnosis to the patient. In other words, it needs to come across as, Mrs. So-and-so, you have a diagnosis of functional dyspepsia. So to navigate this problem, a good history and physical examination will go a long way to narrow down potential etiology. Allow the patient to describe their symptoms as well as the relationship to the ingestion of meals and the possible influence of specific dietary factors. Sometimes pictographs may be useful in assisting patients to help them to relay their symptoms. It's important to differentiate the abdominal pain or epigastric pain from other common causes of abdominal pain, as well as from atypical chest pain. The duration of symptoms is also important, and it's important to gauge the actual commencement date of symptoms rather than the period of aggravation, because a longer symptom duration favors functional dyspepsia over organic disease. The patient should be asked about all possible upper gastrointestinal symptoms, including red flags or so-called alarm symptoms. Things like unintended weight loss, uh, progressive dysphagia, GI bleeding, vomiting, and others that are listed on the slide. Find out if the onset of symptoms has coincided with the gastroenteritis-like episode, because infections have been known to be a triggering event for functional dyspepsia in predisposed individuals. Further assess for signs of systemic diseases like diabetes, cardiac disease, thyroid disease, etc., and a thorough family history um, of any significant um, GI cancers, inflammatory bowel disease, and celiac disease should be sought. Physical findings um, such as abdominal mass, organomegaly, ascites, these obviously warrant further evaluation. And importantly, if GERD symptoms of heartburn and regurgitation seem to be the predominant symptoms, then this should lead to a provisional diagnosis of GERD rather than dyspepsia, and the patient should be managed according to, to um, GERD pathways. So you do, though, um, in saying that, you do get overlap of dyspepsia with GERD symptoms, and this happens quite frequently. You also get overlapping um, um, IBS. Um, so when evaluating a patient, one should always check for these associated um, conditions. The use of prescription and non-prescription, uh, sorry, the use of prescription and non-prescription uh, medication should also um, be assessed for and commonly um, used drugs, especially non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, these should be discontinued um, if possible. In patients with uncomplicated dyspepsia, a cost-effective routine lab testing um, has not been established. Some suggested routine bloods include a full blood count, serum electrolytes, liver biochemical tests, thyroid function tests, and in selected cases, one can consider serum amylase, celiac antibodies, stool testing for ovarian parasites, giardia antigen, and a pregnancy test. So the big question, who requires an endoscopy? Historically, Prompt endoscopy was considered mandatory to exclude gastroesophageal malignancy in all patients with dyspepsia. But the yield of this approach to detect cancer is low, um, especially in younger patients. So what do the guidelines say? The recently published British Gastroenterology uh, Society guidelines recommend 
that an urgent endoscopy in, in individuals over 55 years with dyspepsia and weight loss um, should be deferred for endoscopy or should have an endoscopy. And that age is lowered to 40 in patients who are from high uh, areas of high gastric cancer rates or if there's a significant family history. Older individuals with treatment-resistant dyspepsia or a patient presenting with alarm symptoms at any age warrant a non-urgent endoscopy. Patients over 55 with nausea, vomiting, or an elevated platelet count need a non-urgent um, endoscopy according to Brit the British guidelines. And the rationale for this recommendation is based on platelet count, uh, sorry, this rationale for the recommendation based on the platelet count comes from um, a significant association between thrombocytosis and gastroesophageal cancer in a case control study of, a, of around 40,000 patients um, aged over, over 40 years um, in the UK primary care. The Americans recommend, their guideline is a little older, from 2017, they recommend that all dyspepsia patients, 60 or older, irrespective of other symptoms, they require an endoscopy to exclude GI malignancy. And that threshold is lowered, if, obviously, if the patient is from an area, they grew up or they were born in an area um, with high uh, gastroesophageal cancer rates, it is like Southeast Asia, parts of South America, or if the patient has a significant family history. Interestingly, the American guideline actually advocates against endoscopy in younger individuals, um, even in the presence of alarm symptoms. And I thought that was a very bold approach because we're always taught to check for alarm symptoms. Um, but the rationale for um, this recommendation is uh, based on multiple systematic reviews and administrative databases that show that alarm features actually have a low positive predictive value, and they are of limited value in a young patient who's primarily presenting with dyspepsia. Um, however, because of heterogeneity amongst the studies, this recommendation is obviously a conditional recommendation, and they feel that there would be patients less than 60 uh, with alarm features that would warrant an endoscopy, particularly if the features are very prominent or if uh, there's a combination of alarm symptoms, et cetera. So they make the disclaimer, even with that recommendation, that clinical judgment should always be applied. So what about the South African context? The last published South African guidelines that I could find for the management of dyspepsia was published in 1999. They suggest that all dyspepsia patients over 45 should undergo routine endoscopy. So this age cutoff of 45 is much lower than um, the other more recent um, guidelines. I found these two retrospective South African studies that explored age cutoffs for endoscopy and dyspepsia patients. The aim of the first study, which was from KwaZulu-Natal, looked to compare age above and below 60 as a predictor of significant endoscopic findings. And they found that patients over 60 had a significantly increased occurrence of concerning findings of malignancy, stricture, and ulcer compared to those who were younger. And their recommendation um, in terms of indication for age as an indication for endoscopy aligns to the American guidelines. On the other hand, the other study from a tertiary hospital in the Free State found that a high prevalence of significant pathology um, at endoscopy was found in young patients less than 60. Um, young dyspeptic patients with no alarm sounds, uh, signs. They found significant pathology in 40.7% of their cohorts. This label that they gave of significant pathology was not only related to malignancy, but it rather represented a group where outcomes in the management of the patients would have been compromised if they did not have a gastroscopy. Um, they suggest that in South African context, where we have a high HIV prevalence rates, poor socioeconomic factors, high H. pylori rates, and overall increasing prevalence of alcohol and tobacco use compared to Western countries, they, um, they feel that it makes find the finding of significant pathology at a younger age more likely in our context. Um, and they suggest that patients should be offered endoscopy at a younger age. So with these opposing views, we definitely see uh, the need for more prospective studies, uh, preferably conducted at primary health care level to develop um, new local guidelines for managing dyspepsia patients. 
So you have your young, otherwise well patient with dyspepsia. There, there's no alarm symptoms. You've established that there's no indication for endoscopy. The patient's history and physical is, examination has allowed you to distinguish esophageal, pancreatic, or biliary disease. So what should your next step be? Unfortunately, despite many randomized trials comparing the different approaches, the optimal cost-effective approach in the initial management of uncomplicated dyspepsia actually remains unclear. Um, the options that are that have been studied include prompt endoscopy and directed treatment as a strategy, the test and treat strategy for H. pylori eradication, or the empiric anti-secretory drug um, strategy. Let's look at how these uh, pan up against each other. So the first approach of prompt endoscopy and directed treatment, um, the procedure of endoscopy itself actually may have a reassuring effect on patients and the physicians to, to reassure them that no sinister pathology exists. Uh, but what the studies have found is that there's actually little evidence to show that outcomes are significantly improved or that, um, and also they found that the anxiety reduction is often um, short-lived. Um, another proposed advantage of prompt endoscopy is um, it, it, you have the ability to obtain gastric mucosal biopsies to facilitate the diagnosis of helicobacter infection, or um, you could pick up an early gastric cancer. But the question then is at what cost? Um, one meta-analysis found that the rates of upper GI malignancy to be around 0.4%. We saw that earlier. Um, and that suggests that for every 1,000 dyspepsia patients, 996 would be cancer-free at endoscopy. There was also another U.S. study that estimated the cost of detecting one upper GI cancer in patients over the age of 50 with dyspepsia without alarm features in primary care to be over $80,000. So essentially, endoscopy is expensive, it's invasive, and it's not always accessible. Um, and the majority of common organic causes of dyspepsia, as well as uh, functional dyspepsia, can be effectively uh, treated empirically. So um, this approach is generally not recommended in the guidelines. But in saying all of that, it is um, important to note that um, the Rome 4 diagnostic criteria for functional dyspepsia requires a negative endoscopy. So you still might get uncomplicated dyspepsia patients referred for endoscopy. The next strategy um, is the test and treat strategy. 5% of dyspepsia in the community is due to H. pylori infection. So testing for H. pylori, eradicating the bacterium is a logical step. Um, it will also treat H. pylori-related peptic ulcer disease and reduce gastric cancer risk. So the non-invasive testing using stool antigen for H. pylori um, is recommended. Um, it has a similar accuracy to histology to diagnose H. pylori. And um, this test and treat strategy for H. pylori is relevant and it becomes more cost effective when the prevalence rates of H. pylori in a community are 20% or higher. So one, uh, there was a study from MPAT that looked at uh, rates of um, H. pylori um, in South African context and was found to exceed more than 70%. So it's definitely something to be considered in our setting. Um, sorry, in the context of um, dyspepsia, um, confirming that you've eradicated H. pylori, I know we often uh, advocate for this, but it's actually controversial because uh, most dyspeptic patients, even those with H. pylori, still end up with the diagnosis of functional dyspepsia. Uh, but in saying that, it can be done by the same um, non-invasive means. There are other, there is sorry, another less common approach to perform an endoscopy on patients who have confirmed H. pylori on non-invasive testing. This is the so-called test and scope approach. The rationale there is that you like you're more likely to pick up pathology in a patient who tests positive for H. pylori. But um, over the years, this approach has not been found to be more effective, and it's not currently adopted in guidelines. The third treatment strategy in uninvestigated dyspepsia is initiating empirical anti-secretory therapy. And this is widely used in primary care. 
Um, the approach controls symptoms, it heals lesions um, in most patients with underlying aidosic uh, reflux or peptic ulcer disease, and it can be beneficial in up to a third of patients with functional dyspepsia. PPIs provide superior symptom relief compared to um, H2 receptor antagonists, and the response is usually you see a response within two weeks of therapy. Obviously, the disadvantage of PPI is the rapid symptomatic relapse after treatment has been stopped um, and that potential for rebound gastric hypersecretion. So often patients require long-term um, treatment. Um, so in multiple randomized control trials, one approach versus another has not been found to be more effective. So um, they've studied all these uh, strategies um, and uh, put them up against uh, another the other strategy, and they found that none was really superior. So obviously the test and treat, uh, sorry, the prompt endoscopy strategy was always found in the studies to be uh, more cost uh, costly. So, so what uh, a group uh, um, and recently published uh, Leonardo E. Sebi et al. Uh, recently published in the BMJ. They performed a network meta-analysis where they compared the five treatment strategies, um, namely the prompt endoscopy, test and treat, test and scope, empiric acid suppression, and symptom-based management. So they compared these five strategies. Um, there were 15 eligible control trials that uh, recruited over 6,000 patients, and they found that no strategy, even in this analysis, was superior to the uh, any other. So. But what they did see was test and treat was ranked first in terms of reducing the relative risk of remaining symptomatic at 12 months. And in addition, patients who were allocated to test and treat were significantly less likely to require an endoscopy. Um, so this study suggests that test and treat should be the preferred first-line management strategy for dyspepsia in primary care. So... If a patient has refractory concerning symptoms despite initial management, whether it be the test and treat or the empiric PPI or, or even both, um, then these patients warrant further investigation. And depending um, on the um, clinical scenario, um, one may consider specific uh, testing. Um, and this will obviously include an endoscopy to assess for GI malignancy, but if not already performed. Testing for celiac disease and jihadi infection is useful for patients with refractory symptoms, especially when accompanied by weight loss. And in patients with severe pain and weight loss, um, an ultrasound, CT, or endoscopic ultrasound um, can be performed to rule out pancreatic or biliary disease, which is often uh, difficult to diagnose. Um, and in cases of severe postprandial fullness, especially if there's refractory nausea and vomiting, a gastric uh, emptying scintigraphy study can be considered. And, all, and if, if you suspect that there's a uh, mechanical obstruction, a small bowel x-ray uh, can be performed. In cases where you have refract refractory intermittent epigastric pain or burning, um, an esophageal pH with impedance monitoring may be useful to diagnose an atypical GERD presentation where the symptoms are primarily uh, in the epigastrium. Um, psychological and psychiatric assessments are also recommended in patients with long-standing refractory debilitating symptoms, obviously in the absence of um, organic disease. So this algorithm outlines a practical approach to uninvestigated dyspepsia. It summarizes what we've discussed this, thus far, um, and it also leads us on to the next part of our talk, which is the consideration of functional dyspepsia in a patient with a normal endoscopy or care. There's no alarm symptoms, no need for further testing, essentially when organic disease is ruled out. So we're all aware that there's this move away from the functional, in, in, in inverted commas, functional classification nomenclature. Um, so this condition and all the other functional dis uh, gastrointestinal disorders are now classified as disorders of gut-brain interaction under the uh, exciting, rapidly evolving scope of neurogastroenterology. Um, functional dyspepsia is categorized into two subgroups based on symptoms. The first subgroup is postprandial distress syndrome, which is dominated by postprandial fullness. Um, sorry, postprandial um, 
uh, fullness and early satiety. And the dyspeptic symptoms in postprandial distress syndrome are induced by ingestion of a meal. The second subtype is epigastric pain syndrome, in which the predominant symptom is epigastric pain and epigastric burning. Um, and these symptoms usually do not occur um, only, that, sorry, they do not occur only postprandial. They can occur at any time. So there is a, signif uh, a significant number of patients who actually overlap their symptoms uh, between the two groups. So I, I was thinking about um, the rationale for why separate um, or subcategorize uh, functional dyspepsia. And what I found is that um, the rationale for the subdivision, which has actually been around since the round three criteria, is based on the expectation that the pathophysiological mechanisms underlying each group, subgroup are different. So that the feeling is that the pathophysiology is different and then appropriate treatments can be obviously then selected based on those subtypes. But up to day, up to now, this hasn't really been proven or conclusively or observed conclusively because there's so much overlap that exists um, in both pathophysiology and treatment, and we'll see that a bit later. So the diagnosis of functional dyspepsia is based on fulfilling the ROM4 criteria. Um, this criteria, we have said, has changed or evolved over the years. Um, we know that the ROM Foundation primarily laid out criteria for research purposes, but now it's become important in the clinical context to standardize definitions and practices. Um, so according to these criteria, patients are required to have a keyword there, bothersome symptoms interfering with their usual activities. Um, this, this needs to be there for at least six months prior to the diagnosis, and the symptoms should be active within the prior three months. Criteria for um, the two subclassifications, how to diagnose them and what supporting features um, they have, has also been la laid out in the Round four uh, criteria. So how common is functional dyspepsia? I've spoken about the general prevalence of dyspepsia. Um, in this recent systematic review and meta-analysis, they assessed uh, global trends specifically looking at the prevalence of functional dyspepsia. There was a total of 44 studies, including over 250,000 participants from 40 countries across six continents. And the overall global pool prevalence of functional dyspepsia in this article was 8.4%. Um, there were four African countries that were represented in the study, with the prevalence uh, reported at 8.9% in Africa. Developing countries showed a higher prevalence than developed countries, and women um, also had a higher prevalence, 9% versus 7% in men. Um, interestingly, the pooled prevalence has gradually uh, decreased from 1990 to 2020, and possible reasons put forward uh, for or to explain the decrease in um, in uh, prevalence is that um, the global prevalence of H. pylori has decreased uh, globally. Um, secondly, they speak about technological advancements, improved diagnostic accuracy, so we're diagnosing more organic disease therefore, uh, than we did in the past, so we're seeing that uh, uh, in the trends. And then the third explanation is the reduction in infectious gastroenteritis, um, along with improved global sanitation. Um, and lastly, uh, the wrong criteria for functional uh, dyspepsia diagnosis over the years, as it went from Rome 1, 2, 3, 4, it's become increasingly stringent. So that means that there's less people meeting diagnostic criteria. Um, and that was seen in the study because uh, the, pre uh, the re prevalence was reduced using the Rome 4 criteria compared to um, the other Rome 1, 2, and 3 criteria. In terms of pathophysiology, there's no precise uh, pathophysiological mechanism that underlines functional dyspepsia. Um, it's essentially not fully understood. Uh, multiple mechanisms have been described, and not all of the abnormalities are present in all patients. There's still a lot that requires further study. Uh, traditionally, delayed gastric emptying was thought to be one of the main players in the pathophysiology, and that is found, has been found in 20 to 50 percent of patients with functional dyspepsia. So there is an overlap of the uh, 
postprandial distress subtype, um, and there's an overlap between that sub subtype of functional dysphagia and idiopathic gastroparesis. It's been seen in, in multiple studies. Um, the, there's also what um, decreased gastric bundle accommodation has also been described as a, another uh, pathophysiological mechanism where uh, patients become hypersensitive to gastric distension, and that's seen in about 34% of patients with functional dyspepsia. So usually what happens when you swallow food, you, there's a vasovagal reflex that's initiated, um, which causes relaxation of the upper body and fundus of the stomach in response to the antral distension with food. So uh, in patients with functional dyspepsia, this reflex is impaired, so they have difficulty with accommodating the meal within the stomach. Um, functional uh, dyspepsic patients have also been found to have a lower threshold um, for the perception of discomfort and pain uh, during tests where this, uh, the stomach was descended um, and with balloon distension. Um, so they noted patients with functional dyspepsia were more sensitive um, to and had lower thresholds to the perception of pain. Um, and this is what is termed hypersensitivity, visceral hypersensitivity. Um, the duodenum is also more recently gone under the spotlight in pathophysiology um, with the reports of increased sensitivity to the acid exposure coming from the stomach, as well as increased sensitivity to lipid-containing meals. Um, and then duodenal eosinophilia has also been observed, giving the impression of an allergy-like hypersensitivity to the luminal contents um, with an increase in mast cell activation. Um, other mechanisms include altered gut uh, microbiota um, and multiple um, uh, inflammatory and immune uh, pathways have been uh, implicated in, in the development of functional dyspepsia. When it comes to altered central nervous system processing, functional brain imaging studies have proposed that there's a, a model of gut brain signaling errors that can occur. And then we also know that somatization, anxiety, and depression are commonly linked to functional dyspepsia. So let's talk now a little bit about the management as we round up. Uh, Patients should be given a confident diagnosis, um, establish an effective and empathetic, empathetic doctor-patient relationship, um, and the shared understanding will reduce uh, doctor shopping and improve overall quality of life for the patient. Patients should receive education about the relapsing and remitting natural history of functional dyspepsia. They should be informed that cure is unlikely and that most treatments are of modest efficacy. Um, that they should be also be informed that treatment that is offered aims to improve symptoms, social functioning, and quality of life. So the management of dyspepsia is a partnership between primary and secondary care. Um, and as we've said before, screen and treat underlying psychological disorders and be aware of the high rates of overlapping disorders of brain gut um, or yeah, um, interaction. Um, when it comes to specific therapies, um, a stepwise approach from um, first line treatments, then moving to second and third line options um, is important. Um, and just to note that the evidence um, is, is stronger for um, first line options. And obviously, second and third line options the, the evidence is, is a little less. So both pharmacological and non-pharmacological treatments um, are used in the treatment of functional dyspepsia. In terms of the non-functional treatments, um, in general diet and um, lifestyle modification, there's been no prospective studies evaluating uh, lifestyle and dietary factors. Um, there was a report, uh, uh, Phil Chevik's et al. reported that a high-fat meal induced more nausea and pain in uh, functional dyspepsia patients uh, So compared to a high-carb meal or the control meal. And that suggests high-fat food avoidance may be beneficial. Um, smoking has also been associated with the presence of functional dyspepsia with the odds ratio of 1.5. 
So smoking cessation might be effective as well. There was also a recent small randomized control trial of aerobic exercise um, in addition to conventional management that demonstrated a significant uh, benefit in terms of symptoms compared with just conventional management alone. In patients who fail first and second line treatment options, non-pharmacological treatments in the form of gut, brain, behavioral therapies can be considered. There's a broad range of treatment modalities that have been studied, including psychodynamic therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, stress management, mindfulness, and hypnotherapy. And overall, the evidence um, is limited um, overall, um, not much in terms of quality evidence. The largest study of gut brain behavioral therapy and functional dyspepsia was one by Oribi et al. Um, he enrolled 158 patients meeting ROM3 criteria. They were randomized to receive medical treatments plus psychotherapy or medical uh, treatment alone. And the psychotherapy focused on teaching coping strategies for functional dyspepsia and included adapted cognitive behavioral principles. What they noted was that there was a high non-completion rate for the intervention group, only 55% uh, completing the full course of treatment. And both treatment arms did show improvement in six months uh, symptom assessment, uh, but with statistically significant difference in terms of functional uh, dyspeptic symptoms, pain intensity, general health, and psychological status, uh, it, was, it favored the uh, active intervention arm. So first-line pharmacological therapies, um, we've spoken briefly about this, but specific to the management of functional dyspepsia, um, all patients, if, if they have H. pylori, they should receive eradication um, therapy. Uh, it's been shown to, to lead to significant improvement in their symptoms. Um, and all H. pylori, uh, sorry, yeah, so the evidence for this is actually quite strong. There's around 22 randomized trials that have been assessed, nearly 5,000 H. pylori positive uh, functional dyspeptic patients. Um, many of the studies were well designed. Um, and even though the effect of uh, number needed to treat was 12, uh, it was a bit modest, but the researchers of uh, the American guidelines felt that the quality of the evidence meant that there was enough to be confident about that this would treat patients better than placebo. The other, um, so in patients who are H. pylori negative um, or, or, yeah, or those who have completed H. pylori eradication remain symptomatic, one can consider anti-secretory drugs. Um, and there is um, some low quality evidence about H2 receptor antagonists, uh, but these, studies were much older and they recruited patients um, whose symptom profiles would no longer be considered compatible with functional dyspepsia. Remember the older, older um, criteria were very broad. Um, so more is, they wouldn't really fit in with more recent criteria. Um, in terms of PPIs, they've been found to be more effective than placebo at relieving dyspeptic symptoms in patients with functional dyspepsia. The number needed to treat for an additional beneficial outcome was 11. Um, and in, there was, in the study that's noted here, there was no difference in the effect in, in terms of the dose of um, a PPI or the type of PPI or the functional, um, functional dyspepsia subtype. Most uh, guidelines recommend an empiric treatment with proton pump inhibitors for four to eight weeks as first-line therapy. And if the symptoms improve, patients should be maintained on the lowest possible dose. If there's no response, they should be weaned off PBI and the treatment should be stopped. Um, the new kid on the block, potassium competitive acid blockers, the PCABs. Um, to date, I haven't found any uh, these, uh, randomized con control trials assessing efficacy in terms of um, functional dyspepsia. The most widely used uh, pro, so, so prokinetics neuromodulators, the, these can be considered uh, first, second, uh, first line for prokinetics, and then the neuromodulators tend to be more second line treatment options. But obviously, depending on the subtype, um, one may consider one or the other more early on in, in the course. Um, the most widely used prokinetic metoclopramide. Um, it's never really been shown convincingly to be effective in functional dyspepsia, but despite that and quite significant concerns about safety, long-term safety, um, 
some it's still been used. There are other prokinetics that have been studied, but the biggest concern with these is um, availability. Um, we we mentioned that functional dyspepsia is associated with psychosocial comorbidities like anxiety, depression. Um, so neuromodulators then it's understandable that they would be of benefit to modulate pain sensation and reduce visceral hypersensitivity. Tricyclic antidepressants are effective second-line therapy, um, or in some cases, third-line therapy for treating functional dyspepsia. Um, in a pool, in a meta-analysis of eight randomized controlled trials, um, the pooled relative risk of a symptom not improving with tricyclics was 0 0.76 compared to the placebo. Um, but we know tricyclics have a higher incidence of adverse events, so patients should be counseled appropriately. The most commonly used tricyclics um, is amitriptyline, which should be started at a low dose of 10 milligrams once daily and gradually titrated to a maximum of 30 to 50 milligrams daily. Um, imipramine, 25 to 50 milligrams once daily can also be given. Um, and the B British Society Gastroenterology Guidelines suggest continuing these drugs for a minimum of 6 to 12 months and assess response. Um, other neuromodulators, SSRIs, um, SNRIs, like then the flaxine, um, anti some other antipsychotics. Th these have been, they, they obviously have neuromodulator properties, but overall studies have failed to show definite evidence um, uh, for benefits in, in, of the, with these uh, specific uh, agents in patients with functional dyspepsia. Uh, pregabalin is a gabapentinoid, which reduces visceral hypersensitivity, um, leading to pain modulation. Um, in a recent randomized controlled trial, um, self-reported symptom relief rates and reduction in global symptoms were higher with pregabalin compared to placebo at four and eight week follow-up. Um, so if used, it's also very important to monitor for sedating um, side effects. Many patients um, will come to you to telling you about all the herbal remedies that they've uh, tried. Um, there are over 44 herbal preparations that have been studied and reported to be of benefit in, patient, in the treatment of patients with functional dyspepsia. Um, in a recent meta-analysis of the for the herbal preparation STW5, commonly known as Iberagast, I think it contains like nine um, natural occurring um, uh, uh, herbals, uh, <laughs> I don't even know the word, but um, it is, so in this uh, meta-analysis, uh, they found that in comparison to placebo, patients taking Iberic Guest had significantly more, a greater improvement in their symptoms after four weeks of treatment. It's actually one of the more promoted alternate medicine treatments. There's another uh, commonly used, particularly in Japan, Japan, um, it's called Rikunchitu. It's a ghrelin enhancer. I don't even know if I'm pronouncing that properly, but it's been studied in several clinical trials um, and has been shown to be superior to placebo in functional dyspepsia. Um, and it seems to be especially effective in addressing uh, um, epigastric, uh, the symptom of epigastric pain. Um, we did mention briefly duodenal and intestinal dysbiosis in the pathophysiology of um, functional dyspepsia. Um, there were two randomized controlled trials that studied the effect of rifaximin in patients who have failed first and second line treatments. And they found that um, there was an improvement in global dyspeptic symptoms. So rifaximin is currently, um, you know, it's been viewed as a potential promising agent, but obviously um, requires further um, studies. So in conclusion, functional dyspepsia is a complex multifactorial disorder of um, gut-brain interaction. It's highly prevalent in the community. Um, we need an effective um, approach to the diagnosis and the management. Um, so as to improve healthcare sy systems, improve uh, patients' quality of life, um, and just general um, uh, societal um, improvements. Um, and effective, um, so sorry, I've also highlighted the importance of effective communication and a stepwise approach to the management of functional dyspepsia. We've also seen throughout the talk many areas for potential research. 
So I do look forward to see what the future holds. And yeah, thank you. Um, if there's any questions yeah. or comments, please feel free. Thank you so much, uh, Jillian, for this excellent overview of a very difficult um, condition to manage, I think both in the public and the private sector. And, you know, just stressing how important it is, you know, for the physicians to um, uh, you know, give a confident diagnosis and really be uh, honest with their patients because they can be very difficult to manage and also quite difficult to convince, especially if you don't find any abnormalities. Um, you've also highlighted that, you know, we as sages are not really keeping up with updating guidelines because um, yeah, the, 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 the guidance you mentioned, you mentioned was old, but the ones that you showed were, I think they were, you know, studies. I, I remember yes, one that was presented to one of the sages meeting, but um, obviously I think, you know, in order to, you know, come up with guidelines, you have to have your own data which will guide how you, you know, create your own guidelines or guidance. So I think this is one thing that we as academic uh, institution need to look into. Um, just, I'm just curious to know, like in terms of, you know, where you're practicing now, um, with regards to, you know, the strategy that you follow, do you guys follow the test and treat? Do you do endoscopy? Or do you do the, the anti-secretory therapy first? And then which one do you tend um, so I can speak from, um, I spent a lot of time in um, general medicine, uh, internal medicine practice. So I can speak to that. Um, there's a tendency to use empiric PPI um, first in patients presenting. Um, a lot of people aren't really um, quite familiar with the non-invasive testing for H. pylori. So we're trying to do our best to educate and, and inform people. Um, so yeah, I think we tend to tend to use the H, uh, sorry, the empiric PPI as a first line in patients in general. Um, but in terms of what the experience has been now um, on the other side in, in the training program is that um, we obviously, patients are referred to us. So often um, diagnosis is, has been entertained, um, some tests have been done, um, and we, if we are doing an endoscopy, we tend to take biopsies and, and um, look from that point of view. So I think it's probably a combination, um, and it obviously depends, I think, on what, uh, where exactly is the patient presenting to, primary care, secondary, tertiary care. Yes, you're right. I think most of the time patients come to us, they would have had some form of investigation done. Um, I think what I've seen uh, with most GPs is that they would do the H. pylori antibody tests rather than the, H the stool uh, antigen, which would give more information. And uh, um, just with regards to also availability, you know, because I mean, at Charlotte, we used to have access to the Lancet uh, stool antigen uh, test. So we do the test as Charlotte and then it would be sent off to Lancet. But I guess maybe it's cost and whatnot, they discontinued that. And we also don't have the urea uh, breath test. So what we've been doing more is empiric therapy. And then if it doesn't improve, you know, we reassess and then see if we have reason to do endoscopy. Um, are there any questions from anyone? There's a question in the chat box now. Hello. Oh, oh dear. Well, chat box, chat box. There. Let's have a look. Can we? So it's from uh, but uh, but you said. Can we combine the adverts such as caraway oils as first line treatments? Anything to say there, uh, Jill? Um, so I haven't come across Caraway oil in my reading, so I can't really say. Um, what I do know is that um, be careful of herbs and the liver. So um, that's always something. So I'm not sure. I can't really answer that. And if anybody else has experience. Yeah, Yusuf, so I think the, maybe the one commonly used in this condition is the one that Jill mentioned, the iberogast, and 
we have uh, combined it with uh, you know low dose PPIs in uh, some of the patients. Uh, any uh, input from the heads of units or any of the other delegates? Um, Gillian, thank you for your presentation. I thought it was wonderful um, and beautiful slides. Um, you went quickly through the um, algorithm for uninvestigated dyspepsia. I was just curious as to the place or the role for an ultrasound abdomen to exclude gallstones and sort of um, that type of pathology. I know you kind of mentioned it, but in that algorithm, I was just wondering where where it came, if it did. Can you just so, clarify that, please? So from Thanks. my reading, I didn't really... So in general, in uninvestigated dyspepsia, um, it's not really included um, in the stepwise approach. Um, and what I did see was that um, if so, if the patient's symptoms match the symptoms of uh, dyspepsia, then the yield from an ultrasound is usually very low. But obviously, if the patient's um, symptoms are more in keeping with bilirubin or um, gallbladder disease, then um, it can be considered. But Primarily, if the patient says, these are my symptoms um, related to meals, um, they found that that the yield from out routine ultrasound is not really um, that high. So it's not usually what I came across. I'm not sure. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I think you're right in that uh, it's not really uh, included in any guideline. And so one would have to use the the patient in front of you, the clinical features, probably the comorbidities uh, and the nature of the symptoms uh, to decide when and if you're going to do an ultrasound. My guess is that it will probably come after a negative uh, OGD. Um, I imagine, or you might have a patient referred to you who already has had an ultrasound somewhere else because it's non-invasive and that hospital maybe doesn't have endoscopy facilities. Uh, Newa, what do you think? Yeah, sorry, I'm a bit um, in a bit of a loud, a loud area. Yeah, I think it's, uh, yeah, it might need to come down to individualization of the therapy of the, you know, different patients. So depending on what the patient uh, come up with, and you as the physician would have to sort of individualize it in a person and, and see which uh, therapies would best suit them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and if I may, just one more comment, Julian. So the issue of um, what we call non ulcer uh, dyspepsia in patients uh, who are H. pylori positive. Uh, I saw you showed a, a number needed to treat of 12. We have had such hot and heated debates about whether you should treat um, uh, with a PPI or not in this group of patients. Um, and amongst us here who are trying to come up with some guidance of some sort, uh, it's still, uh, the jury's still out. We can't agree on whether we should treat these patients yeah. or not. Some people have very strong feelings about that. Um, yeah. So I think it's an interesting question. Um, I think if you know, for me, the principle is simple. If one is going to test for H. pylori, I feel that if it's positive, um, you must treat. So yeah. I guess I'm saying that if you don't have any intention to treat H. pylori, then probably don't test for it. Mm -hmm. uh, because once you have H. pylori, we know that irrespective of symptoms, it does cause universal inflammation. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, there are other factors like prevalence and cost effectiveness. And like you said, that some patients will still have residual um, symptoms even after treatment, uh, cost and all of those things. And so, yeah, I think um, over time, I hope we'll be able to agree on, on, on something. <laughs> but uh, we don't have enough local data to, to really make a suggestion. I think there's another question in the chat from you, sir. Uh, for the epigastric pain syndrome type, how long should we place the patient on PPI before we consider it futile and move to tricyclics? 
I think you mentioned it. Uh, I did, yeah. So we did. So you you do give the patient a, a trial of um, PPI. Obviously, also counsel patients on effect. Uh, no proper dosing of PPI, which is important. Patients should be taking it before their meals. Um, and they have a, I think, if I'm not mistaken, um, four to eight weeks, but I may be wrong. Um, and then obviously if it's not working, you wean it off and you stop it um, and then move to the um, other treatment um, options. Mm. Okay, so uh, Dr. Naidu just added in the chat that uh, H. pylori is a class one carcinogen, so it keeps it detected. All right, yeah, so I think if there aren't any more questions or uh, comments, uh, I'd like to close the session and thank Gillian uh, okay. for an excellent presentation. And also thanks to the ECHO University of New Mexico and the ECHO India team for their support. Uh, please note that the recordings will be available on the Cancer Foundation website. And yeah, definitely thank you to the Casper Foundation for uh, making this meeting possible. Thank you. So um, thank you so much, Gillian, and uh, good night, everyone. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Evening. Good night.